Good morning. The first item of business today is general questions. And we start with question number one from Mary Fee. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government how it tackles discrimination against gypsy travellers. Minister Jean Freeman. Thank you. The Scottish Government recognises that gypsy traveller communities are among the most disenfranchised and discriminated against in Scotland. We're continuing with work in a range of areas to achieve better outcomes for gypsy, gypsy travellers. For example, we fund and support the work of the Scottish Traveller Education Programme, which works to promote and develop inclusive educational approaches for mobile and settled gypsy and other traveller families. Mary Fee. Can I thank the Minister for that answer? The 2015 Scottish Social Attitudes Survey highlighted that gypsy travellers continue to be one of the most marginalised groups in Scottish society and still face disproportionately high levels of discrimination. 31% of people have stated that they would be unhappy if a family member was in a relationship with a gypsy traveller whilst a further 34% of people have stated their belief that a gypsy traveller would be unsuitable as a primary school teacher. In light of this, it is clear that the government's gypsy traveller strategy is failing. Will the, the minister agree to an immediate review of the, of the strategy and outline what further steps the government will take to eradicate this deeply unpleasant and systemic discri discrimination which is faced by the gypsy traveller community across Scotland. Minister. Thank you very much. I'm afraid I cannot agree with the member that the, gyps the government's uh, strategy has failed and therefore is entirely responsible for the attitudes that she outlines. I'm sure the member knows, <coughs> excuse me, as well as I do, across a range of discriminatory practices and attitudes and behaviours affecting a number of groups in our society. It is actually the responsibility of all of us, not simply the Scottish Government, to tackle those and to do that at every level in our community. Nonetheless, I do accept, of course, that the government uh, has a clear leadership role in this regard. And as the Cabinet Secretary uh, has already said, she is currently uh, consulting with uh, the Gypsy Traveller community and others to reflect on and improve the approach that we take in order to tackle the specific issues that people confront uh, now, but in, in order also to build on the work that we've done in terms of health, education, the suitability of sites, and our current work with local authorities. All of that will be reported back to this Parliament in the revise and the development of the work, which, as we've already said, will come forward in 2017. Annie Wells. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what specific action it has taken to assist the Roma living in Govan Hill, particularly in relation to the findings of the BBC Scotland study, which found that of the 310 local Roma people interviewed, more than a third of the Roma people were receiving less than the minimum wage. Minister. Thank you very much. Uh, and I uh, would share the members' concern, as I know others uh, on these benches do with regard to that particular community. Of course, that is also part of the discussions that the Cabinet Secretary uh, is leading in the spirit that this government so clearly adopts across a range of things we do, where we consult directly with those most affected uh, in order to make sure that the work we undertake is as effective as it can be. So the, the Roma community uh, is part of these conversations uh, and we are looking at particular enforcement uh, activities and looking in particular uh, with respect to housing and integration in that community. Question number two, Maurice Golden. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government, in light of recent figures published by SEPA suggesting that ministers did not meet their 2013 target, what action it is taking to improve household recycling rates? Cabinet Secretary Rosanna Cunningham. Um, as the member knows, it is for councils to provide recycling services to households. The figures produced by SEPA are a compilation of the figures provided by each local authority. There's a wide disparity between the best performing authority and the least well performing. Since 2013, we've agreed the Scottish Household uh, Recycling Charter with COSLA to harmonise recycling and collection services with 20 local authorities already signed up. We've provided financial support for councils to implement the charter, uh, starting with £2 million to East Ayrshire Council announced last month. We've committed to reviewing the rural exemption for food waste collections in rural areas. 
And of course, overall, since 2011, we have provided some £25 million to councils to support the introduction of food waste services, uh, thanks to which 75% of households now have access to a food waste collection service, up from just 300,000 in 2010. Morris Golden. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that response. Currently in Scotland, local authorities deliver their own recycling strategies with decreasing levels of support from the Scottish Government and its agencies. This has led, as the Cabinet Secretary pointed out, to varying levels of service and differing outcomes in recycling rates. The most recent SEPA figures show a patchwork of recycling success and failure across Scotland. Compare this with Wales, which has encouraged local authorities to take a consistent approach to recycling. Their recycling rate recently hit 60%. They beat their target, they doubled their rate in 10 years and they leapfrogged Scotland, leaving Scotland the worst recycler in Britain. Does the Scottish Government agree that a unified and consistent recycling collection service throughout Scotland, coupled with the requisite Scottish Government leadership and support to local authorities, would help us achieve our recycling targets? Well, I indicated some of the actions that uh, already have taken place, including uh, money that has gone to local authorities. Yes, there is a wide disparity. I referenced that in my initial response, but that does show that it is possible for councils to, to do extremely well. Um, there are councils that have significant challenges. Um, as it happens, I'm going to British Irish Council in Guernsey tomorrow, which is on the circular economy and will be dealing uh, with waste issues. But the, uh, the member raised the question of what Wales is doing. Wales uh, has done a very great deal, uh, but I wonder if he's looked in detail at what their programme means, because amongst other things, it involves fines for councils who don't meet their targets and individual targets placed on councils rather than a national target. Now, you know, I can imagine that there would be a very considerable amount of debate about that. We are currently in a space which is about collaboration and encouragement and I would rather have stretching targets that we don't quite achieve, but continue to do so through collaboration, um, uh, than, uh, uh, than at this point go down the compulsion route. Um, you can never rule it out, but frankly, I don't think this would be the right time to be starting to look at those. Question number three, Rhoda Grant. To ask the Scottish Government when the Cabinet Secretary for Rural Economy and Connectivity will next visit Loch Arbor. Cabinet Secretary Fergus Ewing. Uh, Presiding officer, I visited uh, Fort William last Friday, 28th of October, for an aquaculture finfish summit, and I regularly visit the Lochaber area in my role as the Cabinet Secretary for Rural Economy and Connectivity. Rhoda Grant. The Cabinet Secretary will be aware that Rio Tinto plans to sell off the smelter in Fort William. He'll know that it's a crucial industry in Lochaber, with 150 jobs directly employed and many more supported in the wider community. Can I ask what discussions he's had with Rio Tinto? Does he know who the proposed buyer is and what support can he offer the employees in Fort William and the, com the new company in this difficult time? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, yes, the, the uh, smelter is uh, an integral part of the economy in Fort William uh, and indeed is a national asset. And of course, as the member knows, I was myself the constituency MSP for Lochaber for the first 12 years of this reconvened parliament. So I entirely share her sentiments about the importance of this matter. I'm pleased to inform the member that the Scottish Government and Highlands and Islands Enterprise have maintained dialogue with Rio Tinto throughout the Lochaber strategic review with a view to securing the best outcome for the workers and the community. The workforce was informed on the 21st of October that the Rio Tinto board had agreed to consider a sale of its Lochaber assets and that exclusive discussions with potential buyer would begin. Obviously, the sale is an ongoing commercial process and, presiding officer, we must be careful to respect the boundaries of commercial confidentiality whilst negotiations uh, continue. Uh, we are hopeful the business will be sold as a going concern and that aluminium production at Fort William, which uh, began around 1929 will continue for many generations to come. Kate Forbes. Thank you. Does the Cabinet Secretary agree with me as the MSP for Le Chabre that continued operation of the smelter, development of industrial activity and the creation of employment and economic value should be top priorities for Le Chabre? Cabinet Secretary. Yes, I think Kate Forbes as the constituency member is absolutely 
correct, and we do need to respect and provide the appropriate space for the commercial process that's underway. Uh, however, we are prepared to offer support to any successful bidder which makes the necessary commitment to the local community in relation to employment, industry, commerce and renewable energy sources. And indeed, the ideal scenario for Le Haber, presiding officer, I, I hope everybody would share the sentiment, would be the continued operation of the smelter, but also enhanced development of industrial activity in the West Highlands and the preservation and creation of economic value that that entails. Question number four, Alexander Stewart. Thank you, presiding officer. To ask the Scottish Government what action it's taking to minimise antibiotic resistance in livestock. Cabinet Secretary Ferguson. The Scottish Government has signed up to the UK five-year antimicrobial strategy 2014-2018, produced in collaboration with public health and animal health authorities across the UK. The strategy combines actions in the human and animal health environments. A working group, CARS, that's Controlling Antimicrobial Resistance in Scotland, has been set up and is chaired by the Chief Medical Officer and is developing detailed plans to implement it. The Scottish Government also monitors scientific developments in antimicrobial resistance, liaises with other administrations and public bodies with an interest in animal health, public health and food safety, and implements a veterinary surveillance programme that monitors the emergence of antimicrobial resistance in animals. Alexander Shute. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for his response. He will be aware of recent surveys that have taken place, and one of the most worrying was carried out by Cambridge University when it found that one in four supermarket chicken samples contained antibiotic resistance E. coli. These resistances are one of the major health challenges of our generation. To ask the Scottish Government what economic assessment it is taking place to improve uh, this whole process and to ensure uh, that any of these uh, resistances are, are managed and how that is being tackled within the livestock sector in Scotland. Cabinet Secretary. Um, well, I'm not sure that this is a matter that's been raised with me by the member, but I would question the, uh, the uh, thesis, which I think he's just made, and I, if, if I'm wrong, I, I apologise. He's just said that an economic analysis is necessary to deal with the efficacy of, uh, of work tackling antimicrobial resistance, if that thesis is made, it's patently untrue. Uh, I mean, the, the work that we need to do to tackle antimicrobial anti resistance is work for experts in, in veterinary matters, in pharmaceutical products. It's not anything to do with an economic analysis. However, uh, if I have, and I don't want to do justice to the question because it's a serious matter he's raised, if the member wants to write to me about these complex matters, of course, I'm happy to consider them further. Peter Chapman. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The Minister will be aware that the vast majority of farmers are, are, are profession and professional and skilled and are already managing antibiotics for livestock in a sensible, proportionate and responsible manner. Does he agree with me that the last thing they need is to be bogged down by further government regulation and red tape? Cabinet Secretary. Um, well, I have a lot of sympathy for that viewpoint and uh, you know, I respect the work that farmers do and they care deeply about the, the health of their livestock and Mr Chapman as a farmer is well placed to uh, express these sentiments. What puzzles me <laughs> is that the approach which he's just, just expressed does appear to be almost directly in contradiction <laughs> with the approach of his colleague that was expressed just a moment ago. So, you know, which is it? Do you want more <laughs> regulation or do you want less regulation? I do think the Conservatives should... Uh, should, uh, uh, should cease this apparent schizophrenia on the important issue of antimicrobial resistance. Question number five, Monica Lennon. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I begin by declaring an interest as I am a member of the Royal Town Planning Institute. My question is to ask the Scottish Government whether it will amend legislation to extend planning controls on changing premises into betting shops. Minister Kevin Stewart. Hey, Presiding Officer. Uh, the Scottish Government will lay the changes to planning legislation regarding betting shops before Parliament by the end of the year. Monica Lennon. Thank you for that answer. Um, I welcome this commitment from the Minister because it has been over two years since a previous Minister, Denet Mackay, held a summit on this very issue. And it has been disappointing that no action has been taken to extend planning controls on changing premises into betting shops in that time, a measure that was introduced in England over 18 months ago. 
Given that the clustering of betting shops, particularly in our most deprived communities, has continued in that time, and that the Scottish Government has upheld six out of the seven uh, most recent betting shop appeals, when can we expect the youth class order to be amended? And can I ask the Minister whether the Scottish Government will assess the cumulative impact of clustering on communities over and above not just betting shops, but also payday loan shops and fast food takeaways? Minister. Thank you, President Officer. Is Alec Neil, the then Cabinet Secretary for so Social Justice, Communities and Pensioners' Rights, stated in Parliament on 5 March 2015, we were seeking powers promised in the Smith report, which would have been more effective in addressing the problems of payday lending uh, and problem gambling, gambling rather than just planning controls. As the Scotland Act 2016 did not deliver these powers, we are now introducing these planning controls. The Scotland Act 2016 included a very limited power in respect of the number of fixed odds betting terminals and new betting shops only. Uh, this does not include any powers in respect of FOBTs in existing betting shops. That power remains with the UK Government. Um, I would have hoped that we would have had all of these powers uh, to deal with this appropriately. Unfortunately, uh, we did not have the support to devolve these issues to this Parliament. Yeah. Stuart McMillan. Thank you very much, President Officer. Uh, the Minister will be aware of my campaigning against fixed odds betting terminals and how these machines have had such a negative effect upon local communities. But can the Minister provide assurances that the new powers that are going to be laid before the end of the year uh, they will actually allow local authorities to have a, have a wider range of powers to actually help deal with the scourge of these FOB T machines, notwithstanding obviously the comments from the Minister regarding the limited powers that are coming to the Scottish Parliament. Minister. Uh, thank you, President Officer. I, I reiterate uh, the point that what we're getting is very limited powers, and I would have hoped uh, that we would have had wide-ranging powers uh, to deal with this. Uh, we will introduce legislation to amend the Town and Country Planning Use of Classes Scotland Order 1997. Currently, the order excludes, excludes from planning control the changing of certain premises to betting shops. That exclusion will be removed. Graham Simpson. Uh, presiding officer, I think uh, Mr. Stewart, who's struggling with his voice, has probably just answered my question. I was going to uh, urge him to use the powers that he has uh, in the planning review uh, to give councils the uh, authority to um, say how many betting shops there should be. Uh, but I think he's said he'll do that. There we are. Minister, do you want to add anything? Um, I will just reiterate the point, President Officer, uh, that we will uh, lay that legislation before Parliament. Question number seven, Douglas Rock. Sorry, question number six, Adam Tompkins. Th thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on how it's advancing the local devolution agenda. Minister Kevin Stewart. Scotland's democratic landscape is being transformed by the implementation of the Community Empowerment Act 2015, the introduction of an islands bill and the development of legislation to bring council functions, budgets and democratic oversight much closer to communities. In parallel, empowering reforms are being delivered across Scotland's key public services. Adam Tompkins. It, it's well documented that Scotland is now one of the most centralised countries in Europe. Just yesterday, the Scottish... Well, just, just, yesterday, just yesterday, the Scottish Local Government Partnership criticised the Scottish Government, not the UK, criticised the Scottish Government for strangling local democracy and castigated it for, and castigated it for bossing local authorities around and controlling everything from the centre. So let me ask the Minister this. The, let me ask the Minister this. The SNP's programme for government commits to working with local authorities to review their roles and responsibilities. Can he, with, with, with the, will the scope of this review include the devolution of any identified power from this parliament to local authorities in Scotland? Minister. Uh, thank you, President Officer. 96% uh, of Scots think that local people should be involved in making decisions about the design and delivery of their public services. Uh, and this government is committed uh, to ensure that communities across Scotland uh, get a louder voice uh, and stronger powers. 
during the course of this parliament, uh, we'll introduce a bill to decentralise local authority functions, budgets uh, and democratic oversight to local communities. As I stated earlier, we're consulting on and bringing forward an islands bill to reflect the unique needs of these communities. We'll enable community councils that can demonstrate a strong democratic mandate to deliver services. And working with local government to set a target of having at least 1% of their budget subject to community choices budget, budgeting. Uh, and this will mean that over 100 million pounds uh, of spending will be influenced uh, with a direct say from local communities. That is true devolution and true community empowerment. Yeah. Yeah.